I said, well, probably so. I, don't, I hope she wouldn't want me to say, well, we'll have a bad one, please. Since you're not here, we'll just have a bad one. I'm just teasing. No, she wasn't at all. Amen. Amen. But I, I'm at the point, I can't hardly wait to get to church. Amen. I mean to tell you. Amen. Did you put a deal in it? I forgot. Hallelujah. I'm starting a new, just a four time, four part series tonight. I taught it in the, when I was teaching the, the Sunday school class on the other side. And uh, it comes from a Bible study the UPCI sends out about, uh, it's uh, um, actually from the men's ministry department, but uh, it's uh, about having dominion. And if you remember that I, I uh, ministered to us Sunday morning about what happens, remember I'm preaching to your potential, right? Anybody remember? It was just Sunday. And uh, thank you, brother. And uh, this is kind of a lesson that will tell you what happens after God sets you free. What happens after you're filled with the Holy Ghost and uh, what, uh, what happens as you go further on down the journey? Amen. I plan on going a long way, Brother Billy, don't you? A long way with the Lord. Brother Pete, I'm going to go all the way with him. Amen. Amen. It's good to see Sister Bobby Sue with us. It's not a celebrating occasion that she's here for, but I do appreciate you being with us tonight. And uh, it doesn't seem like it's been a year. Not at, not at all, but uh, thank you for being here. It's good to see Jackie and Virginia back with us. Boy, we missed you all this weekend. Bad now. Yeah. Good to see y'all. Good to see y'all come in. I'll have to give Roger the business tomorrow. I'll, I'll send him a text and give him the business, but I, I'm going to see you all tomorrow night, right? The Bible study we're going to teach over at Roger's house. Do you remember that? Yeah. I ain't going to let you forget. Talked to Gerald, Lacey's husband, today for a long time at the hospital. He just asking question after question after question and talking about how you, he never felt so much love and never felt so much spirit and power. What a great church that we have. And he just kept saying, Pastor, I see your vision. I see your vision, Pastor. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Now. And so uh, uh, we just have to pray that Gerald... And, and it's good to see Sister Liz's daughter with us tonight. It's so good to have you with us tonight. Amen. I apologize for forgetting your name, but that just means you need to come more often. <laughs> but uh, I'll introduce myself again after, after church. We well know your babies. It's good to see LaDonna here with us tonight. Amen. Amen. My goodness. Good, it's good to have everybody. Sister Norma, good to see Sister Norma with us. I mean to tell you. Praise the Lord. It's just good to be in church with everybody. Amen, isn't it? I'll tell you what, Sister Barker, I don't know whether to cry or get mad at you. i tell you what, Sister Barker fell last night and broke her wrist. Just came from the doctor, I bet you. I bet y'all didn't even go home, did you? Just came from the doctor getting a cast put on it, and she came to the house of God. Amen. i tell you what. Mm, it is. It is. It is. Let me tell you, she don't do it for you to clap for either. She does it because she loves the Lord. And I thank you, Sister Barker. I thank you. That's part of my heritage right there. Isaac Newton said, if I ever accomplish anything in this life, it'll be because of the giants upon whose shoulders I stand. And I, I concur with that. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 29 Verse number 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. And I don't know about you, I, I don't know about you, but Brother Billy, the hairs on my kneecap stand up when I read that just that one little passage right there. The Lord thinks about me. The Lord sits around and ponders about me. Thoughts of peace 
and not of evil. To give you, everybody say, to give you you. an expected end. The English Standard Version says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. The American Standard Version says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith Jehovah, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you hope in your latter end. I don't know about you, but these scriptures tell me that the Lord plans on me making it. The Lord has big plans for you and I. The Lord sits around and dwells and thinks on what we're going to be able to accomplish together with him. Amen? That excites me. What does the Lord think about me? It is evident that he desires for us to succeed, to live a life of dominion as opposed to defeat. If you would listen to the news or watch the news, or read it on the internet, or in the newspaper, them things do still exist, it would, it would appear that we're all defeated. Huh? It would appear that we're all on the way down. Let me tell you something. The Lord's been here before. And the people of God have been here before. And guess what? They're still here. They're still here because the Lord has plans for us. He has thoughts for us to to have hope in the end. There are several things that we must exercise dominion over in order to be successful in this life, which will propel us to the next life of living in heaven with the Lord. Over the next four weeks, we will learn how to live a life of dominion over, number one, is self. Everybody say self. We'll learn to live a life of dominion over Satan. And we will learn to live a life of dominion over circumstances. And we'll learn to live a life of dominion over the power of sin. We must first realize and prove to ourselves from Scripture that God desires us to have dominion. And in fact, created us to live here on earth lives of dominion. You were not created to be defeated. You were not created to be downtrodden, but you were created to live a life of dominion. Now, well, I got to let you know something. I'm not. I'm not getting into the uh, uh, you know pie in the sky uh, theory of preaching. This is not you know a self help brother. Brother Emery preached against. Preachers call themselves life coaches now. I'm not into coaching your life. I'm into preaching you the truth from the Bible. I don't want to just make you feel good. I want to hit in your heart and in between your ears that God intends for you to live a life of dominion, a life of victory. We got to get our lip up off the floor. We got to get our eyes away from the doom and gloom of this world and realize God intends for us to live a life of dominion. It's not just a good idea, it's truth. Genesis 1 and 26 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Your, the trees in your yard, the rose bushes in your flower beds, uh, or your little pickanese uh, are not supposed to rule over you. I don't care what the media will tell you. I don't care. We were created, mankind was created to have dominion over the earth. Psalms 8, 4, 5, and 6 says, beautiful, beautiful passage, Brother David. What is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. 
Let me take just a little side note and tell you, if, if you weren't fortunate enough to be able to view the message the other night, uh, there's a, I have a new way of thinking about dominion and authority and the power of the name of Jesus. Amen? There's a new revelation that we're not just saying some kind of generic name, but that heaven stands at attention, that the demons run and hide, that disease has to flee at the name of Jesus. That's why we baptize in the name of Jesus. That's why we worship in the name of Jesus. We lay hands on in the name of Jesus. There's no other name but that name. And I, I, this is not in my lesson, but if you want the power of the name, you have to get a revelation of who the name represents. And what the man with the, carrying the name did for you and I. The desire of this series is to get us all on the same page with regard to understanding and exercising the authority that we have in Jesus Christ over these areas. It begins with me. Us, we, I, self. It begins with me. The very it nothing else matters if I don't have control of me. Nothing else matters. The word dominion means to take charge or be in control. As we have established, man was created to have dominion over the earth. This directive to have dominion over the earth or the world involved more, Brother Billy, than just having dominion over the creeping things and over things that are out there. It also means uh, that we have dominion over our world. The world that you live in. And how many of you know we don't all live in the same world? Now, I know we all live on planet Earth, but we all don't have the same environment. We all don't have the same people around us. We all don't live in the same neighborhood. We all don't work in the same place. We all don't have the same hobbies. We all don't have the same uh, uh, preferences. We all don't dress exactly the same. We don't like the same colors. We each live, boy, I could preach right now. I got a preaching spirit on me. But we each live in our own world. And we are intended to have dominion over the world in which we live as opposed to it having dominion over us. This begins when we take charge of ourself. You got to understand something. We must have goals. Can I get an amen? How do you know? There we go. The Bible said where there's no vision, the people perish. Okay, we've got to have goals. We've got to have something we're stretching for, something we're reaching for, something that we're desiring that we don't have right now in the spirit, okay? There must be a drive in us to get better. Got to be a drive in us. Now, we're all aware of areas in our lives that we could do better, right? Eat better, get in better shape, manage our money better, work on our relationship with God and with other people, be a better daddy, better husband, be a better Christian, be more faithful, and the list goes on. For each of us, though, we all have things we all have obstacles. We all have situations in our lives. Boy, I feel in the Holy Ghost, my goodness. I feel like maybe I need to just shut it down and start preaching Acts 2.38 or something. My goodness, I feel the power of the Holy Ghost in this place. Amen. Amen. Let me clean the slobber off my... I don't know who did that, but I'll have to deal with that after church. I try not to, but I just can't. just can't. We, <laughs> praise the Lord, my God, hallelujah, hallelujah. When Jackie and them first came here, they said, we've done a lot of stuff in our life, we ain't never done nothing like that dude's on. 
or something to that effect. But I tell you what, it, it's for real. There's a buzz in living for God, and you get a hold of it, it don't stop. Mercy. But I, I just feel, I know I ain't got much hair, but it feels like it's all just standing up on end. I feel like Bozo the Clown up here with my, my hair standing on ends. Man, I'm not joking to you. I just feel like, you know, like, that, that we're just living in the Holy of Holies, just living in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. My goodness. It, we all have things in our lives. We've all got things, goals that we want, and we all have things in our lives that hinder us from trying to get there. Right? I might add some real and some imagined, but they're there. Family circumstances, financial circumstances, social circumstances, time constraints. Uh, the biggest one many of us like to do is I'm just trying to make a living. And that's stopping me from doing the things I'd like to do. The truth of the matter is that we can accomplish these things. None of these hindrances are actually keeping us from anything we want to do. Because if we want it bad enough, we'll do it. Amen? At the end of the day, the enemy is not someone or something else, but as a man by the name of Kelly said, we have met the enemy, and he is us. The greatest enemy, the greatest detriment to you accomplishing anything is you. There are some principles that if we apply them, they will not only allow us to make a difference in our own life, but they will also enable us to positively affect those that are around us. Huh? How many of you know if you're down in the mully grubs all the time, the people you're around will be down in the mully grubs? So if we get dominion and authority and a positive way of thinking, if, if you'll pardon me for referring to, to Dr. Van Peel's wonderful book he wrote, I guess I had never read it, but I heard it was a good book. but it will allow us to positively affect those around us. The first thing that you have to do is you have to have a plan. Have to have a plan. And there are many of us that we have lived for God as if everything we're going to accomplish is Him throwing lightning bolts out of heaven. Right? If the Lord wants it, He'll go boom and it'll happen. Right? Huh? I've said this before, but I like it so good I'll say it again. We encourage our kids, buy them costumes. You know, I was going to be a fireman. I was going to be a policeman. I was going to be a cowboy. I was going to be an army man. I was going to be a fighter pilot one time. I think of all kinds of things I wanted to be, and everybody encourages it. But when we start talking about what we want to do for the Lord, everybody looks at us like, well, you better find out about the will of God. i got to ask you, where do those thoughts come from? If you decide you want to do something for God, where did it come from? we got to realize that God has something special in place, in mind. Remember I said he thinks about you for each of us. We don't believe that. Not as a body, we don't believe it. We've got to believe that God has something special for each and every one of us. You say, well, what do you know about that? I've already proven, and you amened me, that we each live in our own little world. So there is something you can do that, God, help me right now. There's somebody you can reach. There's a life you can impact. There's something that can be done. Maybe the place you shop, maybe the place you eat, it doesn't make, maybe it's the class you study in, but there's somebody in your world that you can make a difference in, and God wants you to do it. God wants you to do it. Stop this and please, I don't mean to be offensive, but we got to stop that ignorant thinking that there's nothing for me to do. 
There's just, God, help me right now. Boy, I'm in the Holy Ghost. Woo! There's so much more to living for God than what happens in these four walls. There's so much to do other than what happens on that platform. Brother Cunningham said this, and I loved it. Where in the world did anybody ever decide that you got to have a halo to push a hoover? Huh? I hate to keep busting out Jackie, but the last Sunday night Jackie was here. He said, I've been meaning to ask you, is there anything I can do around here? I want to do something. Sister Betty Jo ain't been coming to church. She wasn't coming to church a month before she found her spot on the cleaning team. Oh, God. If you just grasp a hold of it, don't get angry. God help me right now, but I'm fixing to help somebody. There are so many things we can do. There are so many things we can accomplish. But the first thing that's got to happen is you all got to get your skin a little bit thicker. If I got to try to correct you, I can't be afraid. You ain't never going to come back if I do. You won't dance, I will. God has great things. The Bible said, I know the thoughts. I know the thoughts I have for you. I know what we're expecting from you. Boy, I feel the Holy Ghost. I love it. Boy, I love it. Y'all may not go home tonight. Got to have a plan. Most things don't happen accidentally, nor do they happen instantly. We like them to fall out of heaven and hit us on the head, or else we like them to just explode in our life like a genie out of a bottle. Guess what? Rarely, if ever, will it do that. A diet. We all want, I want to fast a day and lose 27 pounds. But see, it don't happen, Brother Billy, because it begins with willpower. But Brother Greg, it is maintained by a plan and sticking to that plan. And if any of you need any advice, Brother Greg's lost 148 pounds, is that right? Since he started his diet. I think that's great. It is. That's great. But it takes a plan. It takes repetitive action. Okay? It takes deciding to do it and sticking to it, even when at first you don't see much results. Physical fitness is accomplished by beginning and following a specific routine. How many of you know what happens the first morning after you wake up to start lifting weights again? In secret places. Not in normal places. But you go out and lift up your arms and it's like knives go into you right here. The backs of your legs. Then the first excuse is given, well, I'm going to wait till the soreness wears off and then I'll go back. And then what happens? A marathon runner. They only run a marathon because they set out to run a marathon. They follow the plan to acclimate themselves to running 26 miles. Nobody just wakes up in the morning of the the New York marathon and drinking their coffee saying, Honey, I believe I'm going to go run that race today. Nobody does. Brother Pete, how far am I going to make it? Not even one mile probably. I tried here a while back to run the shortest, the shortest uh, 
out there at the Dawson Park, they got two circles, kind of. How many of y'all have walked that? I know Sister Ruth does. I, I tried to run, Brother David, the shortest one. Psh, I'm glad there wasn't nobody out there watching. Because after about from here to Brother Shannon, I was breathing so hard, I thought I was going to pass out. Because, Brother Billy, it takes dedication. It takes repetition. It takes doing it again and again and again and again. And sometimes you don't even see any drastic results. Just in several months, you found out you're there. We must also, after making a decision to make a change, we got to take things a step at a time. We must create habits that will allow us to be successful. I got to ask you, where are you going? Where do you want to be? What will it take to get there? And most importantly, how do my plans for me line up with God's plans for me? But you have to get a plan, saints and guests. I don't care if you're here the first time. I've already learned it don't take a halo to run the hoover. Okay, I, I'm just going to tell you I'm nuts and some of you don't get mad at me. Some of that stuff you can't get mad at me about. But if somebody shows up here, maybe not ever darken the door in their life, and I'll come down here with them and give them the microphone and let them sing how great thou art, don't get have an apoplectic and go nuts on me. <laughs> because, Brother Billy, we've got to open up and let people get involved and realize they're welcome here. And they can't, with what's going on right now, they come in here sing how great they are. For you know what? They'd be talking in tongues and filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. We've got to realize we've got to take some of these blinders off and some of these shackles off and realize there's a hungry world out there. Yeah. My buddy told me today, he said, man, I'm tired. I'm so tired of dead ends and losing and said, I'm, I'm just tired, man. And I was sitting there thinking, Brother McKinney, how many thousands are there are just like him, Brother Pete, that are tired of nothing? Of nothing. We've got to get a plan, folks. We've got to get a plan. I'm trying to get, listen, I'm trying to get my nerve up right now. I'm looking for opportunities. I almost did it last night at the checkout line at Ramey's. I run into a man that's sick and my heart started beating really fast in my chest and my throat fell out and I was feeling, pray for him, pray for him. I'm standing there talking to him. He's my friend. Brother Robbie, he is not going to say, no, you stupid idiot, you ain't praying for me. He's going to say, go right ahead. And here's a change that's take place, Brother Billy. Can, can you just, just humor me just a second? is before I went to my truck and I told the Lord, I'm sorry, Brother Dole. I said, Lord, forgive me for not doing it. But I want to thank you that I came closer than I ever have. Huh? Because the Holy Ghost is on my life. And everything that we do, Brother McKinney, we're trying to get somewhere. And Brother Pete, I'm going to take victories anywhere I can find them. Oh, come on, y'all. Y'all got to realize, I know, Brother Billy, sometimes I do make myself too vulnerable and I do tell too much, but I'm just trying to get to heaven and I'm trying to take all y'all with me. Matter of fact, I'm trying to take all them with me. Amen. Amen. And it's work. It's baby steps. I've made up my mind, Brother Doyle. I'm going to see somebody healed outside of this church. But I've just got to keep on working. Keep on pressing and get dominion, the devil knows the power of the name of Jesus. The disease knows the power of the name of Jesus. The one that's sick knows the power of the name of Jesus. The only one needs convincing, the big dummy. Oh, God, have mercy. But you know what, Aunt Nadine? I'm getting there. By the help of God, I'm going to get there. I know Sister Margaret said here a while back after we had a good service, Sister Casey told off on you. I hope it ain't a secret. But she said, I, I feel like I could witness to the president right now if I saw it. <laughs> it. 
It's excitement. So, I ain't going to get done tonight, but who cares? It's excitement. It's the knowledge of, of if, he's do, if he's done this, then that means he can do this. And then that means he can do this. Now unto him. Mm. God have mercy. And the second thing, I'm going to get through this. It's just three minutes after eight. Just seem like we've been here about five minutes. The second thing we have to do, first thing is get a plan. If you don't know what God wants for you, and I'm willing to bet you, yes, I said bet you in the church house, I'm willing to bet you a few million dollars, I can do that since I don't have a few million dollars, <laughs> that there are very few people in here that it don't, don't at least have some idea of what God would like to do with you. Some idea. He may be working it out in your mind. You may be trying to wrap your mind around, God, I can't do that. Don't build by yourself. Gideon said it. Moses said it. I always get a good kick out of the poor little, little uh, red-faced 16-year-old boy, 17-year-old boy. He never did say he couldn't do it. The, don't, the only reason he said he couldn't do it, Brother David, is who knows what kind of battle he fought before the lion and the bear. The second thing is, now I want you to hear me right now because this is important. Learn the miracle of forgiveness. Oh, God. Because each of us has failed. Every one of us has. And we've done stupid things. And we've started good things and in good directions and stopped. And these past failures mock our efforts for today. They mock us and they make fun of us in the back of our mind. You started this and didn't do it. You had a good idea here and didn't do it. So guess what? We quit trying because we didn't. Hebrews 12 and 1 says, Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, let us lay aside every weight, read it, read it for me, say that, let us Lay aside every weight. Okay. And the sin that doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now I want you to focus on laying aside every weight. In that passage of scripture, there is no job for God to do. The directive, Brother Billy, is to us. Lay aside. These words are speaking to our ability to do this. As opposed to it being a supernaturally assisted endeavor. I remember when I was a little boy and it made me mad back then. No telling what it'd do to me now. Brother McKinney preached a little tough one Wednesday night. Cracked down on a few things. We were walking out the door. Somebody said, well, I'm going to have to go home and pray about that. <laughs> well, I'm mad at an old wet hen. The way we was taught, the preacher says it. That's the way it's got to be. Brother Pete, we have the ability to lay aside the weights. It doesn't say for us to say, take them away from me. And I'm not saying he can't. Okay? I'm not saying he can't. But the directive is, lay them aside. There are two keys to laying aside. There are two things that we have to lay aside that will hinder us. 
The, the, the key to accomplishing the first one is very simply this, one word, repent. Things you've got hanging on you. Simply ask the Lord to forgive you for the things, the wrong things you've done. There's a scripture, I like to quote it. I don't know it in its entirety. I get it a little mixed up. But it says, search me, O God. Search my heart and know my thoughts. And if there be any wicked way in me, Take it out. Remove it. Repent. There are so many things that's going on in all of our lives that can be fixed by simple repentance. So many battles we face. So many trials we go through. So much of the devil's coming against me. The devil's coming against me will be destroyed by simple repentance. Because the first place we've got to look to fix any problem is between our own ears and our own heart. That's the first place we look. Jesus' death on the cross guaranteed us that we can have every sin and every failure and every mistake covered by the blood. Do you believe it? Do you believe everything you've ever done wrong from this minute to the day you were born? One prayer of repentance, you can have it under the blood. Oh, that excites me. That excites me. You can have it under the blood. All that's necessary is you cannot assume you've been forgiven. You cannot hope you've been forgiven. And you cannot think yourself into being forgiven. You must open up your mouth and tell the Lord, God, I'm, I'm a sinner. I have sinned against you. I have made a mistake. Or maybe just in case. How many of you know you can repent just in case? David asked the Lord to forgive him of the secret sins. That was things he might have done wrong unbeknownst to him. Forgive me. All we have to do is ask. Then the second step is after we've repented of our sins is living in forgiveness. Now the first step to living in forgiveness is repentance, which we've already learned how to do, amen? Amen. Hopefully, we do it on a regular basis. And if you're praying through the tabernacle, the way that I taught you, you do it every day. Every day at the, alt- at the place of sacrifice, the altar of sacrifice. It is important, however, that we further explore or further consider the power of forgiveness. And we have to, to recognize how it has affected our walk with God. We have to recognize the benefits to getting the stuff out of the way between him and I, Brother Pete. We've got to understand the the benefits of of cleaning my vessel out so the Holy Ghost can flow through me freely, unobstructed. It is possible that even though Jesus has forgiven us and we're aware of that, the weight we're carrying is we still haven't forgiven ourselves. Thinking that God can't forgive you is not a matter of being so humble, but it's actually a matter of pride. We elevate our wrongdoing to the place where even God can't reach it. Is it possible that the blood of Jesus can forgive the sins of everybody in the world except for me? We have to realize and recognize, Brother Billy, because if we've made it to this point, we're walking on a journey with God. We're heading somewhere. We have to remember Romans 8 and 28. Put it in your memory bank. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. If Him and I have come up with a plan together, I'm following him, I'm chasing after him and his desires for me, then whatever's going on in my life is going to work for his good. If we're truly striving to reach a new place in God or do a new work for God or find our place in God, then nothing in your past can hinder God from bringing it to pass. Let me say that one more time. 
Y'all getting all sidetracked on me. People looking all around. That's what happens when I stay up there behind that thing. I got to get out here amongst you. There is nothing in your past that can hinder God from accomplishing in you what he desires. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely. There is nothing in your past that can hinder God from accomplishing in you what he desires. Absolutely. He was a murderer, Brother Billy. I don't know that that went over as good as I wanted it to. Or else our faith is not high enough to accept it right now. There is nothing in your past that the blood covers up that can hinder God from completing whatever he desires in you. Now, if there's something in your past you haven't repented of, it ain't dead. But if you've repented of it and it's under the blood, it cannot stop you from accomplishing what God wants for you. Sure, sure, absolutely, absolutely. You're 100% right. But the devil will use that same thing to try to hold you back. But you have got to look in the mirror and remind yourself, there's nothing I've ever done to stop what God wants done in my life. It's also possible... I'm about to wade off into some shaky territory. Y'all don't get your bazookas out. It is also possible that the weight we're carrying around is our inability to forgive others. If we lie in bed at night, drive down the road, thinking about the wrong that has been done to us, staying awake at night, missing out on sleep, Who's in control? They're still doing you wrong. Even if you've been done wrong, maybe even terribly so, maybe even horribly so, who's really being hurt by your lack of forgiveness? We hold on to past hurts. And the energy and, oh God, I, my Lord, have mercy Brother Shannon, I felt the power when I wrote this down in my, in my uh, whatever that room is over there. Please don't go in it either. I felt the power of the Holy Ghost. We hold on to past hurts and past wrongdoing. And the energy and effort we spend holding on to that is energy that's being taken away from being spent on where we desire to go in God. The effort that you spend holding on to your grudge is effort that's taken away. There's only so much of you to go around. And if you're spending a great portion of you worrying about things that's done you wrong in your past, it is being taken away from stretching forward to your future. There's a strong medical opinion that states that a great deal of sickness has at its core the inability to forgive others by holding on to those things. Forgiveness, understand this, forgiveness is not determined by your emotions. Chances are you will rarely feel like forgiving somebody. Forgiveness Brother Billy, is an act of the will. It's a decision you make. You probably will not feel some great kind of release just, oh, I said I forgive them and, ooh. You probably won't feel an emotional release when you speak the words of forgiveness. The emotional release will follow. 
But here's what happens. When you speak the words of forgiveness, when you say, I forgive you, you give up your right to get even. You give up your right to get them back for what they've done to you. When you say, I forgive you, you have let go. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I agree with that. How ironic is it that you're reading that last night and I'm teaching on this today. Thank you for that. Your breakthrough can, because think about this. If you're afflicted by something and God wants to heal you of it, so why would God want to do that? So you got a testimony and you can go around and build the faith of other people. So in fact, where God's wanting to take you can be hindered by your unwillingness to forgive somebody that's done you wrong. I told you I was going into touchy territory. Oh, fixing to hit that in just a minute. His prayer pattern says, forgive us our debts as we forgive those that are indebted to us. The Bible says clearly in Matthew, I believe Brother David is part of the Sermon on the Mount. He says, when you bring your gift to the altar, and help me on this right now, and you remember that your brother has ought against you, Leave your gift at the altar, go make things right, and then come, boy. Remember, I'm teaching about having dominion over yourself. Say, here's what, well, you haven't had done to you what I've had done to me. You don't know that. I already told you we live in different worlds. You don't have a clue in the world what I've dealt with in my life. Smile at me. Make me nervous. We all deal with stuff. Everybody's been done wrong. There's even somebody that sung about it. Well, there is another somebody done somebody wrong song. That's all I know of it, but I'm sure it ain't on the gospel station, though. Am I embarrassing you? That's the only thing I've been lacking to have the same ministry as my daddy. Because he used to humiliate us sometimes. We go to fancy churches and preach. Daddy told mama, he said, look, I can see myself in the back. If I get all messed up now, I'll just fix it and won't embarrass you. His shirt tail flopped and his pocket would flop. I miss my daddy. In doing so, in repenting, forgiving yourself, and forgiving others, that covers the weights. I promise you, I, I just feel like I can run the aisles right now. If there's sin in your life, or if there's something wrong in your life, when you repent, you get it gone. If you can't forgive yourself of it, then learn to forgive yourself and that's gone. And if you forgive folks that have done you wrong, there ain't nothing else. So living in forgiveness is letting go of that weight that's hindering you. And the third thing, hang with me just a few more minutes. Maybe longer than that. The third thing is learn to walk in faith. Now, if this ever applied, it applies right now. I heard people talking every day. Over here, people in the waiting room. You overhear people at the coffee shop. You overhear people. Don't know if we're going to get a check next week. Don't know if we're going to have health insurance next month. Don't the government shut down. 
I'm not belittling if anybody's worried or anybody's scared, but this just applies right now. When circumstances are unsure, Brother Billy, jobs, relationships, health issues, political climate, we live in the, one of the most unsure times we've ever had right now. When that happens, we tend to become anxious and jittery and nervous. And if we dwell on the uncertainties of the world, we will become distracted and could very well miss out on finding out what God wants us to do. Because we're so worried about everything that's going on around us, we miss the open door that the Lord has set before us. That's why reading, and I'm going to put another plug in for it, and I'm fixing to put you on the spot. That's why reading and memorizing Faith-building scriptures is so important. Now, how many of you have been memorizing scripture after I've asked you two twice? Three, four, five, six, seven. I, Brother McKinney, I quote mine every day in prayer. When I get to the, when I get to the uh, uh, table of shoe bread, I quote them every day. I can do it right now. I've learned six, seven, eight, not ten different verses right now. I quote them every day. And I got me another section I'm working on, or two I'm working on. But we got to get it in our heart. One of them that I memorized is the fruit of the Spirit, Brother David. I've memorized all of the fruit of the Spirit. In row, and I, that's to remind me. That's to remind me. Get the, get, get the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Get it in your heart. Build faith-building scriptures. That's what I put off when I'm full of the Holy Ghost. You don't try to put them off. That's what happens, the fruit that's born when you get full of the Spirit. We must absorb the faith-building promises of the Word of God on a daily basis. We must remember, but my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory. But you don't know what I've done. It, it doesn't matter. If you're faithful to God and you keep up your end of the bargain, I guarantee you, that you ain't going hungry and you're not going to be cold. That's, that's as true a thing as I've ever said. The Lord's promises are not subject to the economy. They're not subject to Congress. They, the, the President, the House, the Senate cannot touch the promises of God. Oh, come on. He fed the prophet with some ravens and a brook. Yeah, you may not get T-bones and baked potatoes and big fancy salads, but you're going to be taken care of. He promised. And the windows of heaven are not subject to a congressional vote either. I ain't getting enough amens on that, but I'm going to preach it till you get it. Until I get the amens. There are two indicators. There are two things that indicate of us slipping into a life where we're not led by faith. And I'm fixing to close up. I'm going to try to finish in four minutes. There are two indicators in our life of us slipping into a life where we're not led by faith. They are fear and anger. Now, while these are normal responses from time to time, it's important that we learn how to act when we feel them. Fear is a natural response. We use fear in raising our kids, amen? Stay out of the street or you're going to get run over. I told somebody the other day, mama taught me that. It was a different world that we lived in back then. But before I ever started school, Brother Terry, I walked from my mama's house to my grandma's house. Okay, three or four years old. Which, I mean, it was just from over here on Capitol Street. Around, the, around Miss Taylor and them's house, Sister Adams and them's house, but I was, I was out of sight. But Mama taught me, don't, don't go across the street if there's cars coming. So if there was cars down by Kenzie's, I waited till they got past. I would stand there for several minutes until I couldn't see nothing as far to the right and as far to the left because I knew I was going to get run over because that's what Mama told me. And I learned the rule of crossing the street. So we use fear for good things. 
Then we teach our teenagers the peril of evil influences in their life. And, and then we must be fearful of making bad decisions regarding the finances of our family. And, but, but all in all, fear or living in fear is not healthy. Fear of the future, fear of failure, fear of what others perceive us as can hinder us from doing what we desire to do. Now God has given us weapons that will destroy fear. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that I can ask or think. What time I'm afraid, I will trust thee. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. He has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. When I'm afraid, I can quote these scriptures in the face of fear. The other night, my wife, this is kind of off the subject, but it's the same, it's the same thing. Amanda left here Monday night with a, with a terrible bad headache. She, she stayed almost the whole time, and, and she went home with a terrible bad headache, and, and she laid down and went to sleep, and then the next day she said, I think it's coming back. Well, I sent her a text message, and I said, pray it away from you. Pray it away. That's what you can do with fear. When you begin to feel afraid, when it, when, it's, when it feels like you're living in fear, you begin to quote scriptures and you pray that fear away. Rebuke that fear in the name of Jesus and it'll go away. I've been there before. Rebuke it. Speak against it. Declare every promise of God that you can think. When we pray, we need to pray these scriptures and commit them to memory and speak them in the face of fear. Anger can also be a natural response. However, the Bible has instructed us very, uh, very explicitly, be angry and sin not. It also says, uh, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't go to bed mad. Anger, hear me now, anger is our reaction to feeling that somehow our rights have been violated. Whether somebody cuts us off in traffic, butts us in the line at McDonald's, we're on the phone too long to one of those people that we can't understand what they're saying. Give me somebody that speaks English or don't call me no more. Everybody looking around. Was he watching me? But it's a natural response because we feel like our time has been upset. Our priorities been upset, okay? It's our reaction to feeling that somehow our rights, our right to do something has been upset. That's why we get angry. The way to take dominion over that anger is to make a simple acknowledgement. I ain't in charge of me. He's in charge of me. And we must learn to trust and believe that God can take care of any situation. Now understand, this doesn't mean that we passively sit by and allow ourselves to be hurt. But it does mean that we give up the desire to have our way in order to let God have his way. And I can tell you right now, I'm lost. I'm starting to lose, folks. Because we have such a desire to be right. I ain't get too many amens, brother Billy. <laughs> But, <laughs> see that you make a copy of this on the church. Now y'all know I'm telling you the truth. We we all like to be right. Amen. And to give up the ability to, to, to be justified. I'm staying mad till they say they're sorry and tell me I'm right. And then what? Then what? Huh? So if we give, I ain't never stopped feeling the Holy Ghost. I just want to let y'all know. And I'm feeling him right now telling me, wind it up. <laughs> You're about to go somewhere where I can't help you is what he's saying. <laughs> Start making the women mad. We got to let God be in charge. Even when we have every right to be angry. Even when we have been done wrong and we have every right to be upset, the Bible tells us, Romans 12, 21, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And when we learn to keep our cool in difficult circumstances, we have shown ourselves. My Lord, 
I can preach right now, brother, again. I, I got about 30 messages coming out of this. But we have proved to ourselves that I now have dominion over anger. And I lose my desire to prove anything to anybody else. Here's the last thing. I'm done. I'm, I'm done. The fourth way to have dominion over yourself is control what you think. Jesus Christ made it clear in his teaching that it wasn't no longer merely important to do right, but doing is precipitated by thinking. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Right? Thinking hateful thoughts leads to hateful behavior. Thinking lustful thoughts leads to lustful behavior. Remember Jesus said in times of old, he defined adultery. But he said now if you look upon a woman with lust in your heart. Ain't that what the Bible says or did I just make that up? Matthew chapter number 5. So we have got to guard our minds. That basically means we're cutting our actions off at the pass. Our thoughts is what gives action to our hands and our feet and other parts of our body. And if we, if we control how we're thinking, and I'm going to give you a scripture for this. I've given it before. I want you this to be one that you memorize. I can tell you, I will testify to you for 100% fact. If you begin to think something that you shouldn't and you start quoting this scripture, before you get through quoting it, it'll leave your mind. I have done it hundreds of times. Okay? Yes, I think things I shouldn't. So does every one of y'all. And some of us do more than think it. Yeah, I went there. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, that means earthly, but are mighty through God. To the pulling down of strongholds. Now get this. Casting down imaginations. Where does that take place at? And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. If it's contrary to what God wants, you know it. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Let's stand. I'm going to make it. I want to make it. And I found out he wants me to make it. I think that may be one of the biggest obstacles to many people living for God is realizing he's for me, not against me. We've schooled people to think, we, me and Brother Robbie talked about it the other day, we've schooled people to think that the Lord's standing over us with a great big old sledgehammer. And when you make a misstep, bam, I knew they was about to do it. I was just waiting. Is that fair? how many people picture the Lord when in fact he's standing there to pull you out of harm's way God's for me and if God be for us not even me not even me if I give up my rights I've got the right brother Billy to make my decisions but if I lose that right and give them up to him as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. As opposed to sons of perdition, or sons of the world, or sons of an uh, ungodly nature. I'll tell you what, we're just going to keep on chug-a-lugging along till the trumpet sounds. And the Lord says, Gabriel, you better take a couple trains to get them loaded. Huh? Sister Virginia, we're going to fill it up. We're going to take as many people, Brother Mark, to heaven as we can. And we've mystified so much living for God. We've made it such a mystical thing. 
that we forgot about all the practical applications of just following the word, doing what it says, keeping myself under control. And the next step is begin to control other things, but I got to get me right first. Isn't that right? Let's lift our hands right now. Dear Lord Jesus, you are a mighty God. You're a wonderful God. You're a beautiful Savior. I want to thank you for this word, Lord. I want to thank you for this word. I want this word to be a lamp unto my feet and a light into my path. I want to hide this word in my heart so I don't sin against you. i got to be under subjection, Lord. I, I've got to live a life of dominion over me. And the only way I can do that is to, to put my spirit in your hands and, and my wants in your hands, Lord. My desires lost in your desires, Lord. I want to be like you. I want to be like you and not like me. I want to be like your word, God. I want to see myself in the mirror of your word and be changed into your complete life. Likeness. Uh, oh God, I want to make good decisions. I want to have good habits. I want to have good friends. Uh, I want to surround myself with every chance I have uh, so that my thoughts and your thoughts are the same, that we're going to make it, that we're going to make it, that we're going to.